The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. I believe He lived and died, and that He rose again. I believe and trust in Him. Ascended into hell, Christ our living head will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe and trust in Him. I will trust in my Redeemer, sing of His love. That lasts forever Know His hope And sure salvation I will trust in Him Oh, the world falls around me I rest and know That He has found me Christ, the rock, is my Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Creed by Richard Jensen from his album, Order of Service. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for Preaching All Salvation Through One Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus, is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English transliteration for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics, questions on and about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome to Pastor Yeshua. As stated in an earlier episode discussing types and shadows, when we study all of Scripture, we tend to see that indeed God seems to create all things according to a pattern which testifies of Him. As we continue to look and study the visible and invisible things of creation, we are able to increasingly see God's reflection to some degree in that mirror. When these examples occur within Scripture, we characteristically refer to them as types or shadows. We shall also see that ultimately, as with all scripture, that these types and shadows point to the substance, which is Jesus. In this episode, we continue our study of types and shadows with the story of the Tower of Babel. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would lead us by your Spirit to greater depth, understanding, and obedience to your Word. Give us ears to hear eyes to see and discernment to know how we each may walk according to your perfect will. Reveal to us now the riches and mercy and love for us, your body, that we might take comfort and strength thereby. In Jesus' name, amen. In order to entertain a complete study of the Tower of Babel, one must properly include a discussion of the flood. Within this context, it is critical to understand the personage and role of the biblical character named Nimrod. The name Nimrod first appears in Genesis chapter 10, verse 8, in the chronology of Noah's lineage. Nimrod is the son of Cush, the great-grandson of Noah. The name Nimrod is often secularly defined in vague Sunday school terms as, quote-unquote, a mighty hunter. The actual etymological definition of the proper name Nimrod is rebellion, and the following record clearly bears this out. We begin in verse 9 of Genesis chapter 10, where it is said Nimrod, quote-unquote, was a mighty hunter before the Lord. The word before is more correctly translated to turn away, 
as in the sense of opposition of, or rebellion with, or defiance of. A research of Nimrod and the terminology surrounding him essentially reveals him to be the greatest rebel of his time. That is to say, not simply that he made poor choices, or didn't really understand what he was doing. By doing a quick study of lineage, we learn that Noah was still alive in Nimrod's day. As a result, there was every reason for Nimrod to have first-hand benefit of Noah's faith, as well as his relationship with God. Instead, it appears that although Nimrod clearly knew good and evil, sin and righteousness, as well as God's way versus the way of the serpent, Nimrod knowingly made choices not only to sin, but to actively rebel against all that God had previously commanded or ordained. Historically, Nimrod is attributed responsibility for the kingdoms of Babel, Nineveh, and other cities which are founded in the plain of Shinar. In summarizing Nimrod in the story of the Tower of Babel, there were, I believe, at least two conditions present in the world at that time which launched Nimrod to the heights of having the stature and influence which he did. One, the world that was had been destroyed by the flood. Noah and his family were all that was left. Three to four generations later, civilization was still fairly centralized and growing quickly. Within the vacuum which existed, people would have a natural need for structure and leadership as the population increased. Geopolitical governing, leadership, and control would be greatly needed and would have been much easier given the environment. 2. The world at that time was still using one common language. Thus, effective communication and understanding was simple and direct. This again would promote an environment which was highly conducive to central governing. As we begin our discussion of the Tower of Babel, we should ask, what then is the significance of the Tower of Babel? Is the story simply about a group of early people constructing a really tall building for that time? Or is it deeper than that? In order to answer the question, we must firstly again draw attention to the utter situation of moral depravity which caused the flood. By reminder, the flood was the logical consequence and judgment by God upon those who rebelled against God daily with their willful sin, defiance, and immorality. Let's remember that the pre-flood world was warned daily by God through Noah and his actions of building the ark. Despite the pre-flood world's access to knowledge regarding the beauty and truth of what it means to know and walk with God, despite being warned by God, the world that was refused to listen and returned daily opportunity to repent with regular mocking and ridicule to God and to Noah. It was this prevailing attitude of callous rebellion and antagonism towards God which was at the heart of the necessity of destroying the world that was through the flood. Another situation which deserves study is what was the mindset of Nimrod and his generation who built the Tower of Babel? To answer, let us notice first what appears to be the intent and purpose of the Tower of Babel as described in Genesis chapter 11 verse 4, where it says, quote, And they said, Go to, let us build a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth, unquote. The above verse reveals that at the outset it is clear that the idea, design, and construction of the tower was one undertaken exclusively by the efforts of men and not God. The next question is, what exactly was to be accomplished by building the tower? The immediate answer usually given is that Nimrod and the others intended to build a city and a tower. This is true, however, the original language as well as the eventual outcome give a secondary and likely the guiding motive to this episode. For example, the word build can equally mean establish or set up. The next word is city or town. The original Hebrew word for city or town contains a root word which carries the definition of to rouse oneself, 
to awaken, to awake, or to incite. The root word has the idea of opening one's eyes. It is because of these underlying definitions that we find the word city as being a place where it is assumed that there are fortifications and guard towers to watch over the inhabitants. As a result, while on the surface the verse can be understood to mean that the people of that day intended to build a city, a deeper meaning gives insight to the possibility that while there was a physical city being built, there was also a conscious effort for man to awaken himself to some central understanding and to unify or combine man's efforts, ability, and potential towards some common goal. The next word, tower, has an interesting root meaning, to grow or become great or important, to promote, to make powerful, to praise, to magnify, or do great things. The word top may also be translated head, top, summit, upper part, chief, total, sum, or height. The word heaven may be translated as the visible firmament, sky, or abode of the stars, or the abode of God. The phrase, let us make, means to make, to do, or produce something by labor. And the word name translates as name, reputation, fame, or glory. Thus so far, the underlying text gives the indication that Nimrod and the rest were engaged in a unifying attempt using their own efforts to labor, to magnify, to empower, and to awaken themselves to the same level of God. Verse 3 gives additional insight for the Tower of Babel, where it says, quote, And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar." Unquote. The word brick is often translated white or whitish, presumably because sun-baked bricks take on the whitish appearance as they dry. However, more properly, the translation comes about because the word brick has the alternate translation of to make white, become white, purify, to show whiteness, grow white, to become purified in the ethical sense. The word burn means to burn, consume, bake bricks, or absorb by fire. Now, before we conclude with an initial assessment, let me point out that there are typically four common theories offered to explain the construction and or purpose of the Tower of Babel. They are as follows. 1. Nimrod built the Tower of Babel to escape the possibility of God's wrath and destruction as a possible result of a second flood upon the earth. 2. Nimrod built the tower as an altar, a center, and a place to study and worship the stars and heavens rather than God. 3. The Tower of Babel was a tangible edifice indicative of Nimrod and the others' desire to unify, proclaim, awaken and purify themselves through their own efforts and righteousness as equal to or superior to rather than submissive to God's authority and righteousness. And lastly four, the Tower of Babel was simply the center of a city and a community inhabited by Nimrod and his followers. Now logically Nimrod and his followers must have remembered well the reality of the flood which their predecessors had dismissed. If Nimrod's desire was to return to the carnality, sin, and depravity of the pre-flood world, then the problem was that they knew all too well the power and reality of God's wrath and may have reasoned that before they could proceed to rebel against God again, they first had to take precautions to prevent God from again destroying their wickedness. If so, imagine what height and depth of arrogance despite the fact these people knew all too well what the result was of rebellion against God, these people made the conscious choice to escape further judgment through the works of their own hands on their own terms as opposed to simply trusting God and submitting to His will. Even worse, 
The underlying language clearly shows Nimrod and the post-flood secular mankind remained centralized together and by unifying efforts of self-awakening sought to rebuild their version of paradise and ultimately magnify themselves as being equal to God. Clearly, this was yet again another attempt on the part of Satan to tempt mankind into the same lie propounded in the Garden of Eden, namely that man can be like God based upon some aspect of his efforts rather than trusting God for God's imputed righteousness based on grace. If we are on track, the Tower of Babel was the first and most quintessential icon of man's belief that man can reach heaven and obtain salvation by his own works and efforts, rather than the pitch, i.e. grace, which Noah used to construct and protect the ark. Nimrod and his team of builders used slime, i.e. filthy works, for mortar. Let this be our lesson, the dichotomy which forever defines the difference between that way which seems right to man and that way honored and accepted by God. Salvation is by grace alone, by faith alone, by Christ alone, i.e. pitch, which comes from the same root meaning covering or atonement. From the beginning of time until the end of time, all efforts, all works by man, no matter how good, how noble, or as filthy rags, i.e. slime, to God. The final piece of our puzzle is found in verses 5 and 6 where it says, quote, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do." Unquote. If the Tower of Babel was limited to the effort by sincere, well-meaning, God-fearing men to merely engineer a structure to avoid a second flood, verse 5 and 6 would make no sense for two reasons. One, God had already promised he would not destroy the earth by a flood ever again. Consequently, anyone like Nimrod who could talk to Noah and who was placing their faith in God's trustworthiness would not feel the need to build anything to avoid something God had promised never to do again. It also makes no sense for God to feel the need to destroy an edifice which sole purpose is to avoid such a flood. Secondly, no one seriously believes that God is destroying the Tower of Babel to avoid man from physically reaching high enough so as to allow earthly man to enter physically into heaven. Nor is it likely that God destroyed a tower, confused their language, and scattered the people present simply because those people had the temerity to establish a city with a really tall tower. We can, however, rightly say God destroyed the tower and scattered the people because of their wickedness. But what specifically was that wickedness and or rebellion which caused God to do what he did? Was the problem simply rebellion and sin? Was God angry because men were worshipping the stars instead of God? What was God concerned that Nimrod and the others would achieve if he did not quickly take preventative action? I suggest that while all of the previously mentioned issues were a contributing factor, the overriding heart of the problem was that Noah and the others believed that by unifying all of known mankind with one belief, one purpose, one language, one religion, and one God that they could live in autonomy and happiness outside the dictates and control of God. Secondly, because Nimrod and the men of that time did not trust God, it was expected the tower would serve as a way to avoid the wrath of God by way of another flood which their forebearers had experienced. In essence, the thinking in part may have been that like a child who received a well-deserved spanking, in some cases the child goes on to repeat that act that caused the spanking. Given the fact that the child has not learned to take responsibility, the child may take a large book or similar item and hide it under their pants as if to say, Ha ha, I'll show my father. 
When we read the latter portion of verse 6, which says, quote, And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do, unquote, it is easy to erroneously conclude that God was afraid of Nimrod and his clan making progress and improvement to the world that was. But the truth is that if God had left this condition to continue, Nimrod and his cult of rebellion would not only propagate the world with their rebellion, but would possibly rule the world. In the end, Nimrod, greater evil, and ultimately Satan would have had a much earlier and stronger foothold on the world and on God's elect. Thus, God needed to intervene to inhibit Satan's efforts and allow for God's elect to prosper and eventuate the promised deliverer, Jesus Christ. Now perhaps this explains the Tower of Babel. But if the Tower of Babel is the shadow and type, where is the substance? Today, as in so many times past, the pressure is on from every corner of the world to attempt to unify mankind. The end game is to achieve centralizing power, government control, and unification of belief systems themselves. The very mention of the word millennium conjures at least two possibilities. One, that there will be a period of 1,000 years of peace brought about and maintained by the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, and by his rule and reign with a rod of iron. The second definition is a period of time undetermined where there is peace and prosperity brought about by mankind and his efforts, or by some centralized government through the unification of all people and all things. The theologies espoused within the second definition ultimately become a secular humanistic religion which denies the God of creation and rebels against his word, as did Nimrod. Modern views elevate secular humanism, moral relativity, and political correctness over scripture and the word of God. Within this paradigm, it is naively believed by an increasing percentage that man has or is on the verge of achieving superiority by his own definition and intellect. Using his flawed and sinful intellect, man vainly believes that despite his inability of having been in every place possible in the universe and having assimilated every possible known piece of information in time and space, that he can pronounce with certainty that he knows there is no God. Since supposedly there is no God, man is now at liberty to do what is right in his own eyes and call it good. Perhaps worse, there are many who have the need to force their own definitions upon God and redefine his word, scripture, to justify themselves. While the general above principle has been attempted since before the Tower of Babel, nowhere and at no time has this philosophy been more pervasive than today. Virtually everywhere one goes there are whole industries devoted to supporting and promoting the idea of a millennium eventuated and hosted by man apart from God. Sadly, not only is this endeavor forever doomed to failure, but it is, in fact, the very fertile soil and spawning ground awaiting the Antichrist of end times. The Christian saint who abides with discernment in Christ knows all too well the reality and imminent arrival of this period of time in history. There are doubtless many questions which arise regarding what our various roles and destinies are. For example, 1. Given the fact we as discerning Christians can see the tower under construction, what should be our response? Answers A. Matthew chapter 5 verse 10 through 16 command us to be salt and light to the world around us. B. Luke chapter 19 verse 13 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3 direct the body of Christ to withstand against spiritual decay and decadence through steadfast prayer, truth, justice, mercy, and righteousness in and through the power of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. 2. What about those who don't know Christ? Where do they stand? Why are they involved? The answer is twofold. A. There are those who, to one degree or another, are spiritually blinded. There is no spiritual discernment. They do not see, hear, or understand because they do not abide in Christ, 
nor does the Spirit of Christ abide in them, despite what they may think, say, or do to the contrary. Thus, if this group comes to salvation, they will only do so when the worst of circumstances forces them to question and discard their willful blindness and hard-heartedness. B. Second, there are those who will ultimately never repent of their rebellion and pride. This group is like Pharaoh. They will be shown every power and work of God in their lifetime, yet in the end they will perish forever in their attempts to deny God's power and glory and to destroy God's elect and remove God from the heavens. Today, as in Nimrod's time, there are many who are busy at work attempting by whatever means and for whatever motives working diligently to remove God at any cost from the human discussion. Like the case of the Tower of Babel, many use technology, supposed intellect, science, and philosophy to undermine, confuse, remove, alienate, and anger as many as possible from the truth of God. Many would replace God and his word with secular humanism, materialism, or outright deviance and rebellion. Whatever the definitions, a large part of mankind is racing to remove all mention of God while simultaneously substituting their vices, sin, immorality, and carnality which constitute the building blocks to erect the tower at the center of the city now named the new and or the one world order. At this point, some would say, hey, stop being so dramatic. Don't take an ancient Sunday school story and try to correlate it to an actual conscious geopolitical movement underway today. That's simply too literal. If this is perhaps a thought you might be having, I submit the following for your consideration. As we compare the shadow to the type, the form to the substance, it is interesting, if not significant, to take note of the European Parliament building in Strasbourg, France. The building very closely resembles a painting done in 1563 of the Tower of Babel by Peter Bruegel the Elder, a Flemish Northern Renaissance painter. While some will continue to say, this is simply a coincidence, the European Union itself produced a poster depicting their mission which provides final clarity. The poster itself features a combination of the 12 stars of the European Union flag with a combination of the European Parliament building on one side and the Tower of Babel on the immediate other side. The poster displays the motto, quote, Europe, many tongues, one voice, unquote. This being the case, the European Union is clearly referring to the above Genesis episode in question, saying emphatically to all that their goal is in fact ultimately to rebuild the Tower of Babel, as well as a defiant reversal of the act of God done at the Tower of Babel. It should come as no surprise that Satan would have the goal to continue his plan started with Nimrod in the Tower of Babel, but it does come with some great sorrow and regret that many who claim Jesus Christ, his Holy Spirit, and the discernment which comes from the new birth, that these same people would buy into the idea and philosophy that any man or combination of men in any age would by their own efforts be able to facilitate the coming of the millennium or ushering in the kingdom of heaven by human works, efforts, engineering, or enlightenment. While Nimrod and his followers were destroyed, the spirit of rebellion which inhabited and motivated Nimrod and his followers is alive today. While the Tower of Babel was destroyed so utterly that no remains are left, the efforts to unify mankind under one banner and reach to heaven continue under construction presently. Today, just as it did in Nimrod's time, the Tower of Babel continues to be rebuilt, progressing back into the heights of heaven and beyond. The reunification of speech, thought, purpose, and belief continues stronger than ever, whether by choice or by force. The ultimate goal is to remove God from his throne 
or to redefine who and what God is to such a degree that God is nothing more than a rubber stamp of approval on any and all of man's delusional rebellion. From some standpoints, the tower being built is magnificent, ornate, well-built, and long overdue for completion. There are, in fact, many who would propose making it a crime to think or do anything which causes obstruction to the construction. Yet, Others, consciously or not, attribute philosophical purpose, meaning, and perhaps salvation itself as being contingent on the tower and its merits. The reality is that there will remain many who will continue to rebuild the tower and to rebel against God. I am sure that many today, like in Nimrod's time, believe that the tower would circumvent overcome, nullify, and survive God's wrath while permitting man to reach his full potential of being God. To those, Scripture reminds all, according to Luke chapter 6, verses 46 through 49, quote, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whomsoever cometh to me, and heareth my sayings, and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house, and digged deep, and laid the foundation on a rock. But he that heareth, and doeth not, is like a man that without a foundation built a house, and upon the earth, and against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great." Unquote Lest there be any confusion as to what foundation is that rock, Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 11, which say, quote, According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ, unquote. By conclusion, let the word of Jesus our Lord himself in John chapter 14 verse 6 resonate for all eternity and throughout all the earth for all to hear and understand. Quote, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Unquote. Father, I pray that you would empower each of us through your Spirit to labor for those things which do not perish according to the world and the flesh. Give us strength and wisdom to invest our lives in that which is eternal and to build all that we have and hold dear upon you, our Lord and Savior, God and King. Let us not be discouraged with the storms of life nor by the unrighteousness of the world around us. Instead, we ask that you would renew our strength and our resolve to firmly stand with joy and hope of our crown of eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you have any questions about God, the Bible, or the Christian faith, I encourage you to write me an email at pastor underscore Yeshua at yahoo.com. That's P-A-S-T-O-R underscore Y-E-S-H-U-A at yahoo.com Thank you for listening. The world falls